You've heard me say many, many times, this is too good to be made up by men. It's too good to be written by men. There, there's no flaws in it. Every other world religion that you can think of has been written and thought up by men has to be updated, has to be amended, has to be changed, you know, has to be made excuses for. If, if you think about the way to save the world, if, what would it look like if a man would have written it? There would have been mistakes. This is too good. It's just too good. Watch this. I, it's from my husband, and I know what it is. I know because he told me right after we were married that... He told me what he was going to get me on this Christmas. I guess I just never thought this Christmas would actually get here. So. See, I always knew that I was meant to be a mother. And my husband was meant to be a dad. I just knew it. I was sure of it. Till I wasn't. It happened slowly at first. I, I didn't notice it. But... After a while, the um, cute little jokes that our friends made, they stopped being funny. And, well, the constant pep talks from our family reminding us that it just takes time, well, that started to become more defeating than encouraging. It's actually a little frightening to think how many dark places my mind went to during those years. I mean, I thought, had I done something wrong? Was I being punished? I even convinced myself that somehow, some way, God had abandoned us in our pursuit of our dream of being parents. I thought, maybe if I prayed more or trusted more, believed more, then maybe, but after years of, of praying and trusting and believing, I had nothing to show for it. Nothing but a broken heart and a bunch of empty tissue boxes. We eventually just learned to live with our broken hearts. I mean, it was just the way it was going to be. Until it wasn't.
if he loves me as much as I love that little girl, well, I don't have to ever question his love for me again. In that video, there's a moment just before the woman picks up the child from the bassinet. She explained that she and her husband had resigned themselves to a lifetime of not being parents. And she actually said, we decided that was the way it was going to be. But following that long pause, remember we saw her smile and she said, but it wasn't. Sometimes it just seems easier for us to give up, doesn't it? Looking at the news, looking out the window at a world that's falling apart, think, you know, what's the point? I guess that's just the way things are going to be, I guess. And then God whispers, but it's not. It's not. Listen, it didn't take some of us very long. Some of you may even remember using your memories maybe even when you were teenagers, to think, you know, after the life I've already lived, all the ways I've screwed up, the, the ways I've disappointed my teachers, my parents, my grandparents, and uh, all the things I've said and done. Nobody really wants me in their family anymore. Nobody really wants me on their team. Nobody really wants me, period. And God, he's probably the last person who would ever want me in his family, so that's it. I'm done. You've probably been there at some point or another, or close to it. But remember, it isn't. It isn't done. It is not. The Bible reminds us that Jesus came at a time when the whole world was living in darkness. We talk about, boy, it's bad today. It's bad. It's bad. You know, I don't know if it can get much worse. It's been bad. We talked again this last Wednesday night. Remember how bad it was in, in just Genesis chapter 6? Genesis 1 to Genesis 6. Remember how bad it got? What did God do? <laughs> wiped, wiped the world clean with a flood. That's how bad it got and how fast. So rem the Bible reminds us when Jesus came, it was, pretty, it was pretty bad even then. Try to imagine your government today informing you, all right, that's it, get up, everybody get in line, everybody march, go stand in line to be counted. Can you imagine a trip to the Purcell Tag Agency that you know is going to last for weeks? <laughs> I, I literally remember the tag agency in one town we lived in that I despised going to. I couldn't stand it every year it was time to renew our car tag. You stood in a long line, didn't seem to matter what time of the month it was, and the tag agent was a very unhappy person who made the experience frustrating and a bit frightening. While you stood in line, you'd hear her dealing with a poor person somewhere up there ahead of you in the line, and before long you'd hear voices start to rise. You go, somebody's upset, somebody's angry. You know, and, and inevitably you'd eventually hear the tag agent say these words, but it's the law! And that put an end to that little argument, a brutal conclusion to it, until the next person. And the next, until it was my turn to have those fearsome words screamed in my face. Believe me, when I say it was very depressing, I would end up feeling unimportant. I would end up feeling uncared about. Somebody needs to do something about this. But I wasn't uncared about. In a world that was oppressed, and I mean oppressed by a fearsome, godless, Roman, dictatorial empire, there was a young pregnant girl who knew differently. You see, she'd been informed by an angel that God was aware of her helpless condition and the world's condition. And he was fixing to do something about it. It's a great story. If you haven't read it in a while, you need to read it again. Everything we, in the video we just saw points to love and everything in the Christmas season points to love. 
Now here we are one week away and maybe you're not feeling the love yet. You know, sometimes that happens, doesn't it? With the situation that you find yourself in from year to year, sometimes it's kind of hard to get there. Are you feeling the love? There's a, a verse in 1 John 3, 1 that says this. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Do you feel like a child of God? Do you feel today like a child of the King of Kings? If you've trusted Christ, if you've accepted Him as your Savior and Lord, you are royalty. You're a child of the King of all kings. We should be called the children of God, and that, it says, is what we are. We don't always feel like what we are. We don't always feel like who we are. We may not always feel loved, but we are. We can't always base the truth on what we feel. You believe that? You understand that? John comes right out and tells us all about this great gift God's given to everyone who will just accept it and recognize it and believe it. The gift of becoming God's child adopted into his family forever because of his great love for us. And here's the thing. It's not based on who you are. It's not. It's not based on what you've done. Aren't you glad? It's not based on how you feel. Hallelujah. It's simply based on God's love for you. You as a person. And for me. Now sometimes you say, well I've heard that already. I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it. It doesn't change the fact that it's true. It's a reason to be hopeful. Even when the outside world seems to be imploding before our very eyes. It's a reason to celebrate. It's a reason to sing with enthusiasm because I am loved. I am wanted. I have sung myself from depression into joy on more than one occasion. Started off just thinking, man, this is terrible. This is a hopeless situation. I'm tired of it. I'm just, I didn't want to face another day of it and just start singing, might start singing a sad song. You know, maybe start singing, that's the sound of the men working on the chain gang. You know, come up with the most depressing song, gloom, despair, agony on me. Whoa, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But then after a while, you sing, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. You know, you can just sing yourself right into the presence of the king. I got to remember whose I am and whose I need to be acting like. Everybody wants that. Knowing that you're firmly embedded in a loving family gives a sense of, of inner peace, security that every single one of us in this room is wired to crave. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be accepted the way you are. In his gospel, John reveals God's plan for making this happen was through Jesus, his own son. Men couldn't have come up with that plan, but God did. John tells us the awesome benefits that come with ev to everyone who will accept the gift of being adopted into God's family. And there are incredible benefits. What's that, uh, that card, the uh, uh, not MasterCard, not Visa, American Express. There are benefits. Remember those old commercials? The benefits that come with that card. <laughs> Nothing compared to being adopted into God's family. John 1, 12 through 13 says this. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Listen, in any further explains. Children born not of, not of a natural descent or natural way, not of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. A couple chapters later, Jesus explains to a man in John chapter 3 by the name of Nicodemus what, he, what John was saying here. To be born into the family of God is not the same as being born to a normal family. Like most of us are naturally born to a man and woman. To be born into God's family, Jesus called it being born again. Remember that? Born again. That was a real popular term. Billy Graham helped make that term very, very popular. Now, Jesus didn't use the term adoption in the sense that he was referring to each of us allowing ourselves to be adopted into the family of God, but that's what he meant. 
Have you ever looked around the Thanksgiving table? You know, just sat there and watched as people were interacting and just go, I must have been adopted. Surely I will tell me, Lord, I was adopted. Well, in God's family, all of us are adopted. All of us. From the, no matter what class you are, no matter what race you are, we're all adopted. In Romans 8, 14 through 17, Paul wrote this. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You know, I'm like uh, the fear of the law. It's the law! You know, you're not afraid anymore. But you receive the spirit of sonship. Adoption is what he's talking about. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. What does that mean? Daddy. That's the relationship you have with God. You can call him Daddy. That kind of intimacy. That's not sacrilegious. No, you have that kind of intimacy. That's what he craves. That's what you crave. So the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies with our physical spirit that I am part of this family. We're God's children. Now, if we are children, then get this, we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. There's scriptures in the Bible that talk about a family. It's like a church family, like a physical family. When one member of the family suffers, we all feel it. When one member rejoices, something good happens, we all rejoice with them. That's what he's talking about. Christ suffered for us. We have to endure sufferings ourselves as children of God, as children of the kings. Sometimes we're made fun of. Sometimes some parts of the world were persecuted. There are people still being killed. 100 to 150,000 Christians are being killed around the world every year, most by Muslims. But there's a lot of good stuff here in this passage. A lot of good stuff. You know, the Roman citizens that Paul wrote to, here in this verse I just read, they would understand adoption. Adoption was really big in the Roman society. They understood the concept of it quite well. So they knew what Paul was doing, and Paul was brilliant. He says, I'm going to explain to these Romans how we are adopted into the family of God in a way that they'll understand. In Roman law, the one being adopted was removed from his previous family and placed entirely in a new relationship as a son or daughter with a new father and thus a new family. And get this, if the son had any debts outstanding, whoo, removed. Wouldn't that be cool? Anybody want to adopt me? <laughs> That'd be cool. Man, all your debts are canceled. A brand new life, a clean slate. That's part of the benefits of being adopted. Can I get an amen there? That's a good one. You see, the adopted son or daughter was now under the control and care of the new father and responsible only to him. It was normal for the new son or daughter not only formally be recognized as a new member of the family, but become a full, rightful heir to the father's estate, just as if they were a blood son, blood daughter. And it keeps getting better. Here's the difference, and I shared this with Jim this morning. I shared it with Matt, too, when he came in the door. I started preaching to Matt as soon as he came in. He was here before 8 o'clock. We were walking in here, and I was just telling him what I was going to talk about today. It was Roman custom to adopt within your own socioeconomic class. Like, I'm not going to go to the slums somewhere and find somebody to adopt if I'm a wealthy enough person to adopt somebody. I'm going to find somebody that's pretty close to my, my economic uh, class, you know, so there's not going to be this trauma, traumatic experience, you know, of trying to turn them into what I already am. That was the Roman custom. But God the Father, he adopts people from any walk of life and elevates them to a place we could never attain on our own. Isn't that cool? I'm glad he was willing to do that. I am a child of the King of Kings, and so are many of you in this room today. I pray I never get over that. Are we living like it? That's the question. Am I living like I'm a child of the King? I mean, when you come in here, and it's time to worship, and I stand up and I say, let's sing. Do you sing like you're a child of the King? Do you sing like you're happy about it? 
Does it show on your face? I mean, I know some of you just walked in maybe from horrible circumstances. But by the time the worship service is over, has anything changed? <laughs> are you reminded again of whose you are? Some of us need to be reminded of whose we are. Paul wrote in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, how God's plan all along was that the Christmas message tie into our adoption into his family. He says, but when the time had fully come, when it was the exact right moment in history, and who wouldn't know better than God? God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. He was born in, many, in, many, in, in the same situation that we were in. He became a human like us, subject to the law. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And the spirit who calls out, here it is again, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we believe, we, we identify with him. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. His Holy Spirit is in your life as a sign, a guarantee that you're part of the family. But how can I make this any clearer? And I thought again of the story of uh, when Nancy and I got married. And I remember the, the, uh, there's a moment whenever you trust Christ as your Savior and Lord. You do what I ask you to do or Jamie asked you to do or somebody in your life asks you, pray this prayer, mean it with all your heart. And you really did. You prayed it. You talked to the Lord. And you asked him to forgive you of your sins. Come into your life. You believe that Jesus is who he said he was and that he died on the cross and that he, like nobody else, is really raised from the dead, proving that he had the power to save your soul and give you everlasting life. And you believe that and you pray that prayer Maybe you felt different, but maybe you didn't. Does it change the fact that even if you don't feel anything, that you're, not, that you're his child? You're still his child. His Holy Spirit just entered your life. He gave you that part of him as a guarantee. You meant it. You're mine. You may not feel any different. But as time goes on, prayers are answered. Communication is, is com committed between you and the Father. After a while, you start recognizing I'm his kid. Just like I said, Nancy and I, we said, I do. I now pronounce you husband and wife. And I didn't feel any different. Didn't feel one bit different. One moment I wasn't married, the next moment I was. But I didn't feel married. I didn't feel any different. But did it change the fact that I was a married man? I was. But as time went on and we developed our relationship and our intimacy and our communication, before long I recognized I'm a married man. I'm married. There's no question. His spirit communes with our spirit and we're going, I'm his kid. I'm adopted into his family. He's my dad. I'm his child. I better act like it. I better act like a married man, huh? <laughs> we need to act like we're a child of the king out there in the world. When that perfect time in human history arrived, God sent his son, born differently than you and I in this. He was born of a virgin. That's too good for man to have made up. Born to a woman, fully human, but born with the Holy Spirit as his father. Supernatural conception so that he did not have a sin nature like you and I. That's what set him apart. Fully God, Fully man, we could not make this up, but God did. So he's not a slave to sin, but he was a son of the king. And Jesus has come to offer you and I adoption into his family. It's that simple. I say, you know, Lord, you saw she met with a lot of lawyers and notaries. and everybody. I said, Jesus did all that for us. He met with all the lawyers. He did talk to a lot of lawyers. And he paid all the fees. And the fines were high for our sins. He paid all of our debts. But he thought you and I were worth it. Isn't that great? Aren't you glad that you're worth that? He loves you. The Bible tells, tells us that the law points out that we actually deserve for our, for our sin is what? Death. That's what we deserve. We deserve death is what the Bible says. It's the law. It, it's, it's like we're standing in that long line just waiting till the day we die. And when we get there, there's going to be Satan looking at us and just snarling going, 
We're saying, but I, I lived a good life. I was a good person. I paid my debts. I paid my taxes. And he's going to look at it and say, doesn't matter. You're going to hell because it's the law. And that's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. It's what we deserve. Where's the hope in that? Where's the peace? You don't exactly feel the love at that moment. So Paul wrote, and this is one every Christian should memorize, Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still deserving death, Christ died for us. He paid the debt. Like that song, he paid a debt he didn't know. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Jesus paid the fine. He paid the debt that the law required. We're adopted into a new family to start fresh. Never again do I have to worry about standing in a line waiting to receive judgment. I have peace with God. I have peace in knowing I'm not only saved from sin, death, Satan, and hell, but I have a secure place in a family with a heavenly Father who loves me unconditionally. And I don't have to wait till I get to heaven. I've got y'all. And you have each other. We have each other. This is a picture, just a, a little picture of what's waiting for us. We need to rejoice in each other. Be grateful for who we have. This is very unique. Do we understand that? Psalm 27.10 Though my father and mother forsake me, abandon me, the Lord will receive me. The Lord will take me in. Even if my blood mother and father say, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I have so messed up or they have messed up or whatever the situation. The Lord says, I'll take you. I love you. I think you're worth dying for. <sighs> Neither of my sons-in-law, I love them. I love them both so much. Neither of them came from homes where they really knew their blood father very well or felt a father's love I remember vividly the first Father's Day meal when uh, Amy's Sean was sitting there at the table with us right here at the parsonage eight years ago or something like that seven or eight years ago and follow our, following our blessing over the meal Sean said this is the first time I've ever sat with someone I would consider a father at a Father's Day table. We got kind of emotional. I did, <laughs> you know. Uh, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful moment I'm never going to forget. Some of you might be feeling abandoned and alone, and some of you may feel like you're standing in that long line. Uh, you're just waiting to get clunked in the head. Be told you're worthless. You've been, maybe you've been told that. You feel worthless. You feel doomed. Your heart is broken. And you think, this is a permanent situation. It's not going to get any better. I've given up on it. But it's not a permanent situation. It doesn't have to be. Aren't you glad? God loves you. He's proved it. What else does he have to do? He's reaching out with his arms saying, hey, come. Come sit at my table and hold hands with your new family. God's given many of us a picture of that right here on this earth. Recognize it for what it is. Praise him for it. The family of God, this church family, gives you a place to belong and peace in knowing you're always going to have a place in the family of God. And once you're in that family and you're really securely in that family, I'll tell you what, you can't be kicked out. None of us are perfect. We still make mistakes, don't we? We do. We still mess up. But he's not going to kick you out. He loves you. Let us help you. Oh, by the way, when this life is over, the inheritance that's waiting for every single one of us, there are not human words to describe what's waiting. The best is yet to come. Amen? As we pray, some here might need to come join this family today. Maybe you need to put an end to your worries and fears. Maybe you need to accept, be, ask the Lord to come into your life for the first time, become a part of this family. His arms are extended. He's waiting. As uh, Brother Jim comes and Brother Bill, if they would come, there's, you have any need today, 
anything you need to settle, come and talk to one of us as we pray. Father, thank you so much for this hardy crew that got up on this cold, bitter, cold day and they came to your house, Father, to worship, to hear you speak. Lord, we came and we play together and we, we eat together and we share together as a family. And then, Father, you, you stand and you take care of us. You, you feed us, Lord, the spiritual food. You said man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the price you were willing to pay for me or the likes of me. Thank you, Lord, that I'm in your family forever. I look forward to it. I don't have to understand it to know that it's true. Thank you. Lord, meet the needs of those that are hurting in this room today, those who feel hopeless, like there's no way out. Lord, may they crawl to you today. May they stand and run to you, whatever, whatever way they possibly can come. Will they come right now in your son Jesus' name? Let's stand together as we sing.